in a day like the one that we live in. The enemy boasts and brags, spreads fear, fears that are so petrifying, fears that are paralyzing, so much so that the people of God don't even have confidence in their prayer. They are not even sure if they call on him, he will answer. Considering the fact that it's even been a long while since they have felt him that close. On the scale that they need him now. It is in such a day that if you are wise, All you need to do is to recognize his name. Everything he does in such a day is for his name's sake. The psalmist said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He makes me to walk on the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Every time God brought an intervention, it is for his name's sake. There are even times that it's so hopeless that there was no man to stand in the gap. But for his name's sake, he had to step out. There have been times that his people had even forgotten about him. But because they were associated to his name, he came through for them. It is not a day to be tired in worshiping. This is not a day to worship and the songs you are singing are just arbitrary songs jumping here and there. It's a day to worship him intentionally. Acknowledging his name. Declaring his name. Giving him recognition. Not just singing for singing's sake. Not just singing for making rhymes and melodies and harmonies. But being intentional about worship. And the worship is one that you do it with understanding. He says, sing praises, sing praises. Sing with understanding. So you choose your words carefully as you worship. Your name is to be hallowed. Adonai. From the rising. From, from the rising. To the setting, to the setting of the same. Your name, your name is to be high. Oh, yes, you are. You don't understand what Adonai means. By that, his name, he lays claim ownership, lordship to the territory of Nigeria. He said from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, uh, my name will be recognized among the headings. And unto my name in every place incense shall arise. So we are not just singing because it's one of those songs. We sing it making a statement, making a declaration of his ownership over this land. We sing it letting everything that has ears 
whether they be found among the sons of the bond women whether they be found in Hades whether they be found among killer headsmen we are making that declaration that his name will be hallowed he doesn't need the hoof of a horse he doesn't need the strength of an ox you know many times when we talk about prayer some people say it's not only by prayer ah, you have no idea what you are talking about by the time this personality we speak about decides to stir himself you will know that he doesn't need anything to bring deliverance about can we take a few more moments to worship him tonight I want every fear to leave your heart from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same your name your name Oh! 
worship pour out of the depth of your heart to him tonight we love you Jesus we hallow your name in our land we hallow your name over our nation we hallow your name we recognize you we recognize you we recognize you we recognize you. We acknowledge only you. We acknowledge you alone. We bless you, Jesus. Be exalted. Be magnified. Be glorified. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, Father. For in Jesus' mighty name we have worship. You may take your seat. Ah. Oh. And that's why we say. one Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 and he speak a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint in this passage Jesus was introducing a parable and the objective of the parable has the learning goal the learning goal the objective of the lesson that the parable is supposed to communicate is to the end that men ought always to pray 
and not to what? Faint. That is to say, if you are not praying, the consequence is what? Fainting. So, if you are, you are either praying or fainting. It is not, if you are not, if you are either praying, and if you don't want to do that, the opposite is not praying. The opposite is what? Fainting. That is the fact that Jesus wanted to communicate. That is the lesson he wanted to teach. That is the objective he wants to achieve in their understanding. He wants them to come to that place where they get to realize that men ought always to pray. Else, the only other consequence is that there will what? There will be fainting. There will be things that are programmed to take life out of them. If you are going to exist as a man, as a human being, the ought that is going to keep you alive is called what? Prayer. So if you are going to live always, you will ought to do what? Pray always. If you are not going to pray always, you are going to be experiencing fainting. And I hope you know that when men begin to faint, they are in the corridors of death. And because of how critical this is, he had to bring a parable. He had to bring a narrative to clarify this fact. So if you are a man, the only thing that can guarantee your existence is what? Prayer that is done always. Unfortunately, unfortunately, what is fought the most is prayer. There are a whole lot of arguments that are made to resist prayer. That are made to discourage men from praying. And a lot of this argument, I mean argument, appear to make sense. They appear to be reasonable. A lot of the arguments that are going to ensure that you will never pray or pray effectively. Most of the times, they will have a lot of sense in them. They will have a lot of reasoning in them. I want to take for granted that all of us here knows that we always need to pray, isn't it? Because the idea of God has so saturated our society that even unbelievers, when they are in crisis and you hear them giving advice to each other, what is the usual thing they say first? You need to what? This is your issue. It's a matter of prayer. So much so that you can see two prostitutes going through crisis and they are encouraging themselves that this is your situation now. is prayer you need. Several years ago, while we were still at the tent in Wurukum, I was in the office one afternoon and a lady walked into the office with a young girl and she told me that she has come for prayers. As a matter of fact, she brought pictures of members of her family as point of contact. But what I found most intriguing was the fact that when I began to interact with her to understand what she needed a prayer for, she shared with me how that 
it's been prayer that have been helping her. She have taken she had taken the issue of night vigil very seriously. And she attends, she doesn't joke with night vigil. She that's the reason why her, her family had experienced some semblance of preservation. And while we kept chatting, trying to understand some of the crisis going on in her life and in her family, I discovered something quite interesting. And she told me that she is a Muslim. Then I began to struggle to add up everything she has shared with me so far. So I initially began to think have Muslims started observing night vigils, bringing pictures for point of contact. So I wanted to understand what was going on. So I asked her, you mean you have become a Christian? She said, no, she's a practicing Muslim, devout Muslim. So I said, I don't understand. You shared with me earlier how you don't joke with night vigils. You know a number of men of God and prayer has really been effective. So um, these vigils, is it in the mosque? How, how? Then she looked me funny like I'm talking about night vigils in the church. I, I am I am fully aware of what I'm telling you. I don't joke with prayers. I attend church. This is what has helped me. So I couldn't make a sense of the situation. How are you doing it? You are a practicing Muslim, but you understand the power of prayer, and you have been a consistent participant in many vigils, you attend church services, you have known how we do it so much so that you even understand the principle of using points of contact. You have been around for so long with us. While still a practicing Muslim. That's to tell you how efficacious prayer is. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's only believers that the enemy is brainwashing to make them not realize the power. Peter said, according to the rendition in Amplified Version, he said it makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. That's how powerful the prayer of a righteous man is. Criminals, before they go to engage in their criminal activities, will come to pastors to pray for them. But believers in the church who are those with bona fide rights to accessing God, their mind are being assailed because there were times in their life they prayed and what the desired intervention in still happened. There were moments in their life that they prayed. And the deliverance didn't show up. There were moments in their life that they were at a crossroad. They were stranded. They prayed. And the evil still befell them. In view of all these bad experiences, their faith begins to fail. Their confidence in God began to wane. And a lot of people are at that place where they just pray. Just for praying sake. They just pray in hope that probably maybe something may happen. But we are not so sure. Don't put your heart on it too much. Just pray and make sure you make other efforts. In fact, don't hide on that prayer. Be serious with your life. While you are praying, be trying other things. Who knows which of them will work? 
You see, from Monday, God began to bring into user-friendly capsules some of the doses that were released during the conference. And particularly last night, we saw that if we are going to engage God, if we are going to experience God, there will be need for praying long hours and praying in such a way that our heart is involved in it. We spend quality time in the prayer. Tonight, I want us to very briefly evaluate a few hindrances to prayers that had made it difficult for us to have answers to our prayers. Hallelujah. Due to several cycles of defeat, cycles of failures, you were in a crisis, you cried, you prayed, you still failed. You were in a situation, you cried, you prayed, bad things still happened. The person that was sick that you cried and prayed on their behalf still died. Due to several of those cycles, the enemy had brought many believers to have an attitude towards prayer that make them feel that prayer is a waste of time. If you have tried everything and nothing has worked, since there's nothing else to do, you just resign to prayer. And because of those past experiences, when you come to the place of prayer, Satan reminds you, that one you prayed, what happened? Nothing. This other one you prayed, what happened? Nothing. Uh, the other day, just recently, that you prayed, what happened? Nothing. What made you think that this prayer now is not a waste of time? And so your energy is dampened, doubt, saturate your heart. It affects your attitude towards prayer. And even when you force yourself to pray, you pray with hopelessness. You pray from the standpoint of defeat. Oh God, talk. We are here. If you will help us talk. You know, like that man whose son was molested by demons. That sometimes the demon threw him into the fire, other times he threw him into the water. The man had gone beyond desperation. He, he has become despaired. He had given up on hope. He had tried everything. So as at the point Jesus was coming, in some mighty men that had cast out devils before have even handled his case. You realize that Jesus went away with three of his disciples to the mountain of transforma um, transformation, right? Transfiguration. So before they came back, disciples about 70 disciples that have done exploits. If you read their profile, if you read their escapades, they are mighty. These were men that Jesus has sent out before and each one of them came back with substantial results. He said, they said to Jesus, even the demons, they obeyed us. These were not newbies. They were not people that were learning the work. They have been in this deliverance ministry for a long time. They have done it in strange villages that they have, I mean, they have been everywhere. This man brought the case to them. All of them tried their anointing. Have you been in a place where brethren come to test the grace on their life? They come to try their axe edge, whether it's still sharp. This one will come, labor, 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 capital tongues. 
Nothing happened. Say, bro, let's see the measure of oil you are carrying. That one comes. He changed the tongue to alpha numeric tongues. Nothing happened. Say, so maybe this kind of prayer, it requires brethren with bass voice. They came and tried. Nothing happened. So if it's anointing, all the flavors, the man saw it. So by the time Jesus was coming, there was no faith again. Our father taught us several years about faith failure. That is worse than break failure. By the time Jesus came and Jesus was saying, do you believe the man? The man was just being polite. He said, I believe. If he's believed, this belief thing, what? You don't know how we have been trying this belief thing here. Before you came. I believe. But the truth is, just help me, help me. Help my unbelief. Just help me. The issue is not whether I believe again. Just help me. Many of us are there in our personal lives. And particularly the Nigerian church is there now. In the last administration, they told us there is a cycle about to be complete. We need to labor in prayer. Men labor. Men prayed. We entered into a shade of darkness that was known for extreme corruption. We endured it. I've not seen men that are as tolerant and as adaptable as Nigerians. We can endure. We are the very definition of long suffering. And then prophecies began to come. They said, this cycle, if, if the church does not seize it, we are finished. We began to labor. We pray hard and long. We enter into that darkness. Ah, ah. What is going on? Why we were thinking that in the third year, we don't even know if we will survive the fourth year. So we cannot have this darkness reset again. That is, we will die. We began to labor in prayer. The cycle was reset. We entered another measure. Now we don't even know where we are. And then on top of all these our prayers that is becoming a reproach on us. The enemy is venting more anger. Releasing more threats. Showing us how helpless we are. And now we are at another season. And when you look at the forecast, you look at the alternatives, it's very depressing. In fact, some prophets got up and said, the whole church need to come together. We are not united. Our fathers need to come together. We need to gather and pray. Some even prophesy that if the church does not unite, what is coming? I'm like, just kill us. God has said, if we don't unite, I say, don't finish it. Just kill us. If we don't unite, how? What do you want to see again? I remember, was it two years ago? One of those evenings, there were different kinds of prophecies flying about how hopeless the situation is. In fact, we are doomed. It's over. They shared a, an audio recording of a dream. 
How many of you heard it? And then there were other prophecies. It became too much. Reverend Tony was leading prayer that night. In fact, there was nothing. He said, in fact, no. He didn't know what to say. He said, no, God will, God will save us. Ay! Everybody's hand is tired. Everybody is weak. Hopelessness everywhere. We are looking for who has the word of the Lord. That we bring a little ray of hope. And the people rising. To suggest that God send them to the church. The conditions they are giving us are impossible conditions. Conditions like the church need to unite. How? Where? So if we don't unite, we are dead. We are finished. So in view of all of that, it's like this prayer thing, just, just forget it. In fact, I saw one WhatsApp over the night. Come and see threat. Threat everywhere. That there's nothing we can do. In fact, there will be war immediately after the elections. So if you have money, just travel out now. Just travel. One of the major fathers, a few years back, he said, have your plan B. Just, how many of you heard it? Have your plan B. So that when it... So those of us that don't, God is the only plan. <laughs> we don't even know whether it's A or B. That is the only one we have. So we are all dead. That nothing can save you now. Only God can save you. And is that only God that can save you? Our heart has become depressed that we can't even trust in that God. That even the people threatening us acknowledge that he is the only one that can save us. And the only way he can save us, which is our last hope, which is to pray. The arguments that demoralize us. When prayer for Nigeria is raised now, you need to look around. We just pray. The person leading the prayer will threaten us. Stand up and pray. Okay, we have stood up. Pray. You need. It's because it's not close to you. You are just like. Okay. Arguments. That paralyze us. In prayer. Another argument is. Does God even care? Have you asked that question? The way we are praying like this. Does he even care? We are not in doubt of his reality. At least we see him move among us. We see him heal the sick. At least we see him move people physically. Because nobody will dress very well and come to church. And at some point will want to fall down. And be jerking. Will any of you want to do that? That tells us that there is something supernatural among us. But when critical issues of life comes, we begin to wonder, does he really care? Then we have another argument. I say the sin of the Nigerian church is too much. The abomination, the atrocity Kai, in fact, is judgment. There's no hope for us. Unfortunately, the names that we hear are perpetrating these scandalous activities. They are safe. They have very comfortable life. It is the everyday people that we don't even know if they are involved in any scandal that are being slaughtered. 
So we wonder, does God care? Or the argument that we are too sinful. He will not be willing to save us again. Our own has, it has become too bad. So prayer cannot save us again. And then the question of the church need to come together. The church need to come together. And since the church is refusing to come together, the few of us that are praying, we are too few. We cannot bring any deliverance. Have you felt that way? Every time we are asked to pray for our nation, you just look at how few we are. You just wonder how many, what is our population in Nigeria now? What? 240 million. We are over 200 million. Right? And then you look at how many of us are here. And then you wonder if the prayer of how few we are can make any difference. Since we cannot be united, those of us that have the burden, we are too few. Our prayer cannot make any difference. It's a paralyzing argument. And then another argument that is most paralyzing because of how spiritual it sounds is that we need ranking men. We need ranking men that can move the hand of God. When you look around, there's no ranking man readily available. So what happened? Haven't you been in that place where you say, Kai, the devil will come and whisper to you, see, this your prayer cannot do anything. Just go and look for a ranking man, a man, a man of stature that can shift this thing. You, you don't have any man of stature in your family. The only one you know is so busy, even when he's around, the protocol will not let you get to him. So what happens to your situation? You are finished, cool? I think that sounds very spiritual, right? And so since they don't, they, there's no ranking men readily available, what happens? Your own prayer cannot change anything. It's like pouring water on a stone. So at the end of the day, we are paralyzed. The attitude with which we come to prayer is a defeated one. One major thing I want to leave with us tonight, because I want us to pray this night. There are so many things to respond from scripture to each of these arguments. Because it is an argument. It is arguments. As you have addressed your heart, say, today I'm going to seek the face of God. Then those whispers will begin to rise up in your heart. Those arguments begin to rise up in your heart. After a while, you see that you have been completely deflated inside. You just feel there's really no point to this. You become despondent. Can we have James 1 verse 6? Let's look at a few responses to these arguments. And then I'll make my major point. From verse 5 he said, He that lack wisdom, let him ask from God. Maybe let's have verse 5 to begin with. He said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraided not, and it shall be given him. If you lack wisdom, ask from God that give to everybody, how? Liberally. First of all, one major challenge we have in the place of prayer is the attitude with which we come to the place of prayer with. 
For example, I highlighted earlier on the argument that does God really care? You know, if you are in need of something and you know someone that has that thing, as you move yourself to approach the person, the question that stares you in your mind is whether the person will be favorably disposed towards you, isn't it? Because if, for instance, you shared with someone that I need this amount of money and I hear that this person has so much money, what do you think? Should I approach him? And they tell you, ah, that man is a very stingy man. Would you bother to go to try? No. The first thing we need to realize is that he is a God that is favorably disposed towards us. Our circumstances may not look like it. Our history may not look like it. It may be that we have prayed in the past and we have really not have good reasons to believe that this God gives liberally. He is favorably disposed. And so we are not sure whether he cares about what we go through. It was Jesus that said, Fear not, little flock, for it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He said, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraided not. You know, there are people that they may not be necessarily mean, they may be a little generous, but when they give you anything, they want to rub it on your face. They want to insult you on it. Have you, you know about such people. He said he gives liberally and does what? Upbraided not. He is the one that will give you a gift and he will not use it to insult you. The critical thing I want to establish in our hearts tonight as we begin to pray is the character of the person that we come to when we pray. It's so critical. Because your understanding of who he is will determine your attitude towards prayer. What we find here is what? He is a liberal person. And he's someone that gives without upbraiding you. He's someone that gives and not use it to insult you. Now verse 6. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Seven. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the law. When you come to God, you must realize that he is liberal. When you come to God, you must not waver. You must be intentional. You must be what? Intentional. You must be focused. Many times when we pray, our prayers are ambiguous. So much that if the prayer is even answered, we will not be sure because of how ambiguous the prayer is. You know, when you read Young Cho's fourth dimension, he shared a story in his personal life once when he was laboring in the place of prayer, praying in tongues for hours until he received a word from the Lord. And then he began to ask that the Lord would give him a new furniture in his house. Oh God, I need a new furniture. Eventually he received it that God has answered his prayer. But by and by, he was waiting and the manifestation was not coming. And then he went to God. What's going on? I have asked you for this. You have given me assurance that I have been heard. 
Why is it not coming? And then the Lord told him, what kind of furniture do you want? You didn't say which type of furniture, what color is your preference. Should I just carry anyone and dump on you? You know, most of the times, our attitude to prayer is that of a beggar. You know what they say, a beggar has no choice. So, anyone at all, just, I will manage. So, oh God, do something. What do you want him to do? You need to be what? Specific. What exactly? So, before you come to the place of prayer, you can't waver. You must be intentional. You must be clear on your mind what you are desiring him to do. Let it be that this is exactly what you want. And if it is not his will for you, then he can tell you what is his will for you. Are we together? You must be what? Specific. You must be intentional about it. Earlier, we were praying for the nation. You realize that even though a lot of prayers have been ascending, if not for the clarity that was brought towards the last session of the prayer today. I hope you know that everybody will have something in their mind for which they are asking God for about Nigeria. Isn't it? Because when we are praying, oh God, let your will be done. One person will be thinking, oh God, let this candidate win. That's what I mean by let your will be done. Another person will be praying, oh God, let your will be done. And what's on their mind is, let this country divide so that everybody will go to their own corner. We must be what? Specific. And that was why that clarity was brought. So that when we are saying, let your will be done, everybody will know what we mean. There is a prophecy hanging over these lands. And that's exactly what we are presenting to God. That this is what we are what? Asking. So when you come to God in the place of prayer, you must be what? Specific. You must be intentional. So that if God is to answer you now, you will know that this is what I ask for and it has come. But if you are ambiguous in your prayers, when God answers, you will still be praying. Because you will not know whether the answer had come or not. Are we following? Next point is that it must be done with a consciousness that we are dealing with a real person. We are dealing with a real person. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. Particularly the prayer in spirit that we pray by speaking in tongues. Many times because it is not intelligible there is a high risk of becoming distracted in your mind. While your lips is praying in tongues, your mind can begin to drift. And at the end of the day, it will just be a mindless activity. You are just praying in tongues. And if you are not careful, I have seen a lot of brethren that are very prayerful. But when you look at their life, you will know that this prayer they are praying they are not praying with a consciousness that they are speaking or engaging with a real person. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must do what? Believe that he is. When we pray, it is God we are coming to. Now, this looks like it should be common knowledge, isn't it? Unfortunately, that is not the experience of many people. There are people that when they are praying in tongues, prayer is just like an activity that when you engage, you know, like 
an ATM machine. You are not dealing with any physical banker. All you need is to have the right codes. If you can slot in the ATM, type in the correct code, it will vomit the money for you. You are not dealing with anybody. That's how prayer is for a lot of people. And that is the reason why some people can be very strong in prayer. And yet their lifestyle is terrible. They can go with grudges. They can have competition. They can have bitterness. It does not affect their prayer life. They can engage so much prayer. Cancel out five hours of prayer. It does not affect iniquity that is locking in their heart. We must realize that when we come to pray, we are coming to God. You are not engaging in a mindless activity because when you pray for seven hours daily, for 21 days, this is the result it will give you. So you can do anything you want to do, live the kind of life you want to live, and just make sure you slot in what? A mindless seven hours for 21 days, and you must pull down the anointing and achieve what you want to achieve. No, sir. We must approach prayer with the consciousness that we are dealing with the Almighty. And when we come with that consciousness, we know that we are dealing with a real person. And there is a protocol of approaching his presence. You cannot come carelessly. As a matter of fact, the old saints will tell you, if I harbor iniquity in my heart, the Lord will what? He will not hear me. The old saints will tell you that the offering of a wicked man is an abomination before God. How much more when he brings it with a heart of deceit? There is a lot of spirituality around that doesn't recognize the authority of God. So people can gain ascendancy in the spirit and yet their heart is not right. And it doesn't affect them. They can conveniently pray. They are waiting for when a direct prophecy will come and call their name in the public and say you must repent of this thing. And because it has not happened, it means maybe they have some exception before God. The quiet conviction of the Holy Ghost we be drowned by loud tongues. No brokenness. Hallelujah. We must come with a consciousness that we are approaching his majesty. And we cannot come carelessly. When we come to God, we must believe that he what? He is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Earlier I did mention that one of the major arguments that paralyze us in our mind when we come to pray is the argument that our voice are too few. Our prayer is too weak. We cannot really make any difference. But I'd like us to know tonight that all that is needed is one faithful witness. Ezekiel 22 verse 30. All that is needed is what? One faithful witness. Give me Ezekiel 22:30. This is God himself speaking. He said, "And I sought for a man, how many people? How many people? A man among them 
that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for who? For how many people? The entire land. This is all that is needed. One faithful witness. So the next time someone comes to tell you, the church need to come together. If not, our own is finished. Tell them, go and sit down. The person we are dealing with, the person that we need his intervention says, he is looking for how many people? One man. One man. One man that will make the hedge. We are more than one man here. In the New Testament, he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be what? I will be there. He will be there to do what? Because these few are gathered under his name, under his authority. He said, whatsoever these few shall agree as touching anything on earth it shall be achieved in heaven whatever these few shall agree and allow on earth it shall be allowed in heaven whatever they disallow on earth it shall be disallowed in heaven all that is needed is how many witness one 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 so if we come with the consciousness that it is the almighty we are coming to meet our understanding of who he is is critical many of us don't trust him and the devil bring arguments from our previous experience to make us see that this is not who he really is. He really doesn't care. He's not liberal as he claimed. But I want us to see a few things. The first thing I want us to see is from our first text, Luke 18. You know, in that passage, Jesus, in a bit to teach the fact that men ought always to pray, he told a story of a widow and a godless judge. A godless judge whom Jesus said he is so mean that he has no regard for God, much less talk about human beings. But because this woman in spite of his disposition towards her, which is that of indifference. And this is the most extreme situation. But because she persisted, she continued, she kept on coming every day. A day came, the man said, this woman will weary me. Let me give her justice. Give me verse 6. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. Now, the reason why the devil will make you feel that other issue, nothing happened. The next one, nothing happened. What's the explanation Jesus is giving here? He did what? He bear long. There are times that God can bear long with us. In his own wisdom. For his own purpose. And because of that, we become despondent. We give up. In fact, we come to that point where we say, in fact... When I needed him, the one I need him for is the last one. And since he didn't bother and the thing went wrong, I don't need him for anything again. There's no point. 
but he said his own elect that cry day and night will he not avenge them in our minds we may feel well when I needed him what I wanted the most he didn't bother so doesn't matter anymore what you don't realize is in your human mind that is what you needed the most but he that made you is the one that actually know what you need the most in your mind you may feel well when I needed his intervention the time has passed it doesn't matter anymore what you don't realize is the one that made time is the one that know the time you need the most. You don't realize that he can, because of you, reverse time. He has done it before. You see, when Hezekiah was sick, God sent Isaiah to tell him to put his house in order that he will not recover. And Hezekiah went back to God and said, Look at how I have walked righteously before you up to this point. You must come through for me. He pulled on his investment he has with God. And while Isaiah was on his way home, God interrupted him on the way and said, Go back. Tell Hezekiah, I have changed my mind. He will not die again. I will add 15 more years to him. However, tell him to ask me any sign as an evidence that he will not die. As a proof that I will add 15 more years to him. Anyways, just let him know that the proof that I will keep my word is that The degree will reverse on the sundial 10 degrees. When you read that passage, you don't understand the full implication. A 10 degree reversal is a 10 hours reversal. One degree per hour. So let's say that that time Isaiah was bringing that word was 5 p.m. If you count backwards 10 hours, what time will it be? Quickly, help me do the math. If it's 5 p.m. in the evening, when Isaiah brought the word, what time of the day will it be? 7 a.m. Do you know the import of that? That is to say, whatever has happened... People that has had accident somewhere around 10 a.m. in the morning. Time has been reversed. What happened? It's like God pressing a reset button. Whatever you thought you lost, when the one that made time reverse it and reset it, and here you are, you are feeling well. My time has already passed. Nothing good can come out of my life again. The one I need him the most for. He wasn't there. You have no idea who we are dealing with. He said, how much more Will God avenge his elect who cry to him day and night? What is that issue that you have abandoned because you have become tired of praying about it? You have given up on it. You don't even know if any intervention can come anymore. He made time. So when you hear him in Jude say, I will restore to you the years. He is the one that can restore anything and everything. 
You need to know who we are dealing with. You need to know who we are dealing with. He is not against you. He is for you. He is not against you. He is what? Can you tell yourself, God is for me? Can you do it one more time? God is for me. There are a few passages I want us to quickly go through in the next few minutes we have. I want to show you who he is. He is not the one the devil has been impressing on your mind. He has been misrepresented for so long. Let's go through a few passages. Let me introduce him to you again. 1 Kings 21 verse 21. It's a lengthy reading. I want us to go through it quickly. 1 Kings 21 21 quickly we're going to do this reading from verse 21 to verse 29 behold I will bring evil upon thee and will take away thy posterity and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and I will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebat and like the house of Beasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowl of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab which did sell himself to walk wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes, put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and laid in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbled himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days. But in the days of his son, I will bring the evil upon his house. This is who we are talking about. Someone as evil as Ahab. How will God say this man was much more abominable than the Amorites that I expelled from the land to give you their inheritance? And upon pronouncing judgment on Ahab, just simply because Ahab just humbled himself. God said, have you seen what Ahab has done? In fact, I will not bring this judgment on him again. That is on a wicked soul. Because he humbled himself. God says, stay the hand of judgment. How much more you that love him? Why will he not avenge you? Let's look at another case. Jonah chapter 3 verse 4 to 10. Quickly. Jonah 3 verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For what came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, head nor flock, 
taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their heart. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he will do unto them. And he did it not. Now, this is a prayer. Give me verse 9. Look at the prayer. He said, who can tell if God will turn and repent? This is a prayer that has no faith in it. From a wicked king that God has decreed judgment. A faithless prayer. What did God do? He changed his mind. Your own prayer is full of faith. Why will he not answer you? If you pray day and night. If you cry day and night. If like that woman, when the Lord tarries and you refuse to give up. Why will he not avenge you? If a faithless prayer will be honored. If a humility from a wicked man, God will look upon it and say, can you see what he had? The first day I read that passage, I was mad. I said, God, you can't do this. Crush him immediately. He's wicked. What do you mean seeing what Ahab had done? What did he do? Can you compare that humility to the wickedness of killing Naboth? Can you compare that lousy humility in my human mind? But he said, do you see what Ahab has done? Kai, I will stay the hand of judgment. How much more you that love him? Why will he not come through for you? You need to know who we are dealing with. Micah 7, 18. Micah 7, 18. Now, this is who he is. He said, who is a God like unto thee? that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever. Why? Because he delighteth in mercy. He is a merciful God. Did you see that? He said... He passed by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. So the next time someone tells you that it is because the church have refused to unite, that is why the judgment is inevitable. And you tell the person, keep quiet. There is a remnant that chose to repent. And because of that remnant, what will he do? He will pass by the transgression. He is a God that pardoneth iniquity. He is a God that does not retain anger forever. He is a God that have delight in showing mercy. If he showed Ahab mercy, many of you don't real, realize that Ahab experienced mercy as evil as he was. He experienced mercy. Not the judgment he deserved. As Nineveh was as bad as they were, they prayed a prayer devoid of faith. God still showed them mercy. The devil will make you feel that God is looking for an excuse to destroy you. 
what you don't realize is that he is looking for an excuse to spare you. Who is a God like unto you? Please stay with me, Micah. Give me verse 19. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. The iniquity of the Nigerian church will be cast into the depths of the sea. Verse 20. He said, Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. Can we rise up tonight? He swore that Nigeria and Nigerians will be known for corruption across the nation. Can you put Pyotin's prophecy? He said their stench will be all over the place. But a new face will come. A face of righteousness. A new face comes. A new face comes. Can you lift your voice up tonight? He say, who is a God like you? You delight in mercy. Can we worship in one moment? He is not against you. He is for you. He is not against Nigeria. He is for Nigeria. Mando perele bosque mbrezu la baraga la baraga la bala baro E la baba baba la balanto The prophet said don't laugh at me oh my enemy When I fall I will rise again When I fall I will rise again Don't laugh at me The God that has compassion on Nigeria he will not abandon us. Can you give him worship tonight? He is a God of mercy. That is his name. He is long-suffering. He is compassionate. He looks for an excuse to bring deliverance. He doesn't look for a reason to bring judgment he looked for a reason to bring mercy can you bless his name tonight eleko le barata e kabalata e malayadash chate ke palina mato lambra zata lambrega de le baragadosh e raba babadanto e raba babalanta can you worship him for his mercy he is a merciful God he is a merciful God he is a merciful God your attitude must change tonight as you approach him, your attitude must change. Your mindset must change.
sure. Ah, ah, yes, yeah, sure. Tonight, I don't know what that issue is that you might have given up on in your life, in your family. An issue you are not even sure if God will hear your own prayer. If it might be that, that your situation needs a big anointing from a big man of God. He loves you. A great anointing can shift it. That is the truth. That is the fact. But that is not the only fact. He loves you. 
Can you present that issue to him tonight? That issue you have given up on. That issue you are working for a big man of God. That issue that you think a corporate anointing is what is needed. That may be true. But that's not the only truth. He also loves you. He said, a broken and a contrite heart. I cannot overlook it. I cannot overlook a broken heart. I cannot overlook a contrite heart. A heart that is humble. I cannot overlook it. Can you present that issue to him tonight? It might be a health condition. You have struggled with for so long. Can you call upon him one more time? Just one more time tonight. It might be a family issue. Can you call upon him just one more time? Just one more time. 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 His mercy is greater than that condition. His mercy is greater. His mercy is greater. Can you magnify his mercy above that condition, above that situation in your family, in your life, the life of your child, the life of your son and daughter? Ele kombela kabele breke bonda kabaya le bro ba 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 go bele mena mama mama ele mo sekene mene malaba we refuse to absorb lying vanities we hold on to the hands of mess we hold on to mess we refuse to absorb lying vanities your mercy is greater your mercy is greater we choose to exalt your mercy. We magnify your mercy in my life, in my family, the life of my children. I magnify your mercy for you will come through for me. I am a comela, a pray to commend the heart. I be bukule, I a pray to remember be meleba mata. No matter the judgment, oh my God, the scriptures say in wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. His mercy is greater than that judgment. 
His mercy is greater than that cause. I live very mantaya. Prema Mose. Prago bobo bo. Leka be 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 la ba ba ba. Lego me sanda ba ba ba. Leka ba 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 lo. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you, Jesus, for your mercy endures forever. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy and you every morning. Oh, my God, we give you glory. We give you glory. We give you glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' mighty name.